Father Bernie, I just wanted to ask you a few questions since my first question is, the ROTC seems not to be your choice activity for young Americans, especially Catholic Americans. And why is that? Well, uh, I went to a, a Catholic college seminary and then uh, for my theology also the seminary of St. Mary's in Baltimore, uh, where we who are preparing for the priesthood were expected to get a good command of what scripture, both Old and New Testament, tells us is the message of Jesus, which has been the message of our Catholic Church for over 2,000 years. Huh? And I learned early on that Jesus did not encourage taking up the sword. We know the scripture quotes about that. He discouraged even Peter from taking up the sword. And now we find that Catholic institutions, whether it's the University of Scranton run by the Jesuits, or Georgetown University in Washington run by the Jesuits, St. Francis University in Western Pennsylvania run by the TOR Franciscans, St. Bonaventure University run by the Friars of the Holy Name Province in my hometown of Olean, all have ROTC units on their campus. And I don't understand it. What does that have to do with evangelization? Now, I have just a hard time seeing that. That's why I joined several people at the campus of the University of Scranton a, a few days ago to uh, ask the leadership there, the Jesuit leadership, why? How does that fit into? And we had a hook. We had something special, uh, a special way to um, raise that question. And that is because the Jesuits there have a memorial to the six Jesuits killed on the campus of their Catholic University, the UCA, as it's called, in San Salvador. Well, I spent about two years working with the church in El Salvador, in San Salvador, and I visited that campus. And as recently as last May, I went there with two university students from Carl University in Pittsburgh to the chapel where those six Jesuits are interred. Huh? Uh, and one of those Jesuits, a very famous uh, Jesuit, Ignacio Ecuria, a Spaniard, but who spent most of his life in El Salvador, was one of those killed. And he told, when asked what he thought about uh, the Georgetown University offering ROTC on that campus, what he thought, he, he said, tell my fellow Jesuits that that's a sin to train soldiers on their campus. So I felt very close. I said, I was right there in El Salvador working in, in the barrio. I was expelled from El Salvador. And the Jesuits up there, including Ecuria, uh, were doing the best they could to object to what was going on. So I feel close to that question. Thanks for asking that question. <laughs> You're the editor. <laughs> All right, Father. The next question is, what why would you suggest young American Catholics not be patriotic and defend their country? Well, I would have to challenge that question. I think you can be patriotic and not take up a gun to defend your country. Mm. I would say we all have to be patriotic, have a certain degree of love for our country, our church, our country, our family, and so on. Uh, the institutions that make us who we are. So yes, I say there's a room for patriotism, but unfortunately patriotism has been reduced to the willingness to take up a gun and use that gun and kill to be called a patriot. Uh, I found out recently that there are the Knights of Columbus in the United States uh, have different degrees of knighthood. And the highest degree has traditionally been called the fourth degree. They call themselves the fourth degree knights. Quite recently though, they have dropped that term fourth degree and now they're calling themselves patriotic knights. Patriotic knights. And why is that? Because only fourth degree knights or patriotic knights can carry their sword in their, in their ceremonies. Huh? When they're dressed in their, uh, their traditional garb, 
then they have their swords and often to accompany or to welcome a bishop to a church for confirmation or different special events the bishop walks under their protective swords huh? well that's all part of a distorted idea of patriotism thank you all right father next question tell us something about your central american experience and how you were able to survive that and be here still well, only for the grace of God, I guess, I was allowed to survive to continue to tell the story, which has grown old, because here we are now in the uh, 21st century, and this all took place uh, in the 1970s and 80s and 90s, huh? Mm. Uh, but there's lessons to be learned from it, and that's why I'm willing to tell the story again and again and relate it to what's going on. Let us take the example of uh, in those times, the United States had such a presence in Central America, which was not only diplomatic, but was military. Even in those days, uh, uh, Washington was training military officers uh, at the School of the Americas, at that time located in the Panama Canal Zone, and had such an influence over what happened there. I don't know if you recall, but in the late 60s, there was the famous soccer war between El Salvador and, Guatemala and, uh, and uh, Honduras. Well, after that war was over, uh, the military advisors who had been advising the two countries' armies, the U.S. was advising the Salvadoran uh, troops, and was it other American advisors were advising the Honduran troops. Over 3,000 Central Americans died as the United States basically used it as a military exercise. Yeah, uh, I found out those details because when I was there, I went uh, uh, over to Honduras and had lunch with some Franciscan priests who have a parish right near the border on the Honduran side. And they said, after the war was over, the two advisor groups got together at their rectory and basically did a summary of how it went, sort of a debriefing of this war where 3,000 people died. So I have so many anecdotes from my experiences uh, there in my some 25 years in Central America that I could go on and on. But that's just a, a short example of uh, uh, how that affects me. And how did you manage to survive? You were kidnapped? Oh, how did I manage to survive? Yeah, you were kidnapped at what point and what year? Mm -hmm. Again, there's so much that could go into that, but it's very specifically, uh, my friend, Father Larry, a Marinol priest, invited me up to his uh, town where he was serving as assistant pastor to a Salvadoran priest who was very strong against the repression that was going on at that time by his own country, then the army and the military. And Father Larry invited me up with my camera at that time, I had a nice Nikon camera, to take pictures of uh, the paintings on the rectory, which was in the town plaza, the center of town, uh, Muerte a, la, uh, a los sacerdotes comunistas, Death to the Communist Priest, which was directed at the Salvadoran priest, who was preaching what he was, the truth. So I got up there with my camera, and I was taking pictures, and along come the police, who wanted to know what I was doing. I said, I'm a tourist taking these pictures. He said, well, come with us. The mayor would like to see you and uh, talk with you. So I went down, the woman, the mayor, uh, she knew everything that I, the, who I was and everything. She said, you're going to take a little trip. And so I had to go into this military vehicle to the headquarters uh, of the National Guard in, in San Salvador. Mm -hmm. um, I was taken in there. Uh, uh, and as soon as I stepped in the door, they grabbed from, from behind, blindfolded me, and uh, took me out to the outside, the, threw me on the floor, and I thought I was Start, they would start kicking and everything else. So, you know, you go into field position and do the best you can and say your prayers. Well, after they did the mocking and all that stuff, never touched me physically. It's more psychological. Uh, they did fingerprinting and all that, and then handcuffed me, hands and feet, to a bed, and all that during the night I was there. And again, the mockery continued through the night. Next day, still blindfolded, uh, I was given my, oh, I was stripped too, <laughs> uh, given my clothes, and I, uh, put in the vehicle and driven around. I knew the city, but where we were going, I didn't know. Uh, finally, when we got to a place, blindfolded off, and I was at the immigration office. Yeah. So I had to go in, 
and go before the immigration director. And he says, you're accused of violating Salvador law and please sign this statement. Well, at the same time, I noticed there was this obviously American there. And I said, who are you, sir? He said, I'm the consul from the U.S. Embassy. I said, oh, thank God, thank God. He said, hey, sign this thing. I want to get out of here. i got stuff to do. I said, what is written there is not true. I can't sign it. I didn't violate any laws. And he said, oh, come on, come on. I refused. So the immigration director gave me back my passport, which he had taken off me someplace along the line. And we left in the ambassador's car. I went to my house, but as I was going into my house, it was now, I was renting from an old woman in San Salvador, about to step inside in a poor neighborhood. A guy was sitting nearby on the, on the curb, and another drunk, I thought, and he said, ¿Quién es usted? Who are you? And I said, soy Padre Bernardo. And uh, so he said, ¡Es Padre Bernardo! I said, you don't have to, I can hear you. And, uh, but then I noticed a van parked nearby, lights come on and comes up towards us. So I saw what was happening, because this Columban priest had just been kidnapped in much the same way days before. So I tried to get into the house, the drunk, so-called drunk, held me, car gets there, guy jumps out, got in the ribs, and forced me into the van face down. And we drove right to the border with Guatemala. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and there, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, I told them, well, um, you've got my passport, uh, we're going to Guatemala, I have a visa multiple, I mean, I can enter legally any time I want to, just we'll take care of it. Anyways, they come out, we drive into this country, just a kilometer, another vehicle, get out, a Mercedes Benz. I was forced into the back between two guys with rifles. I thought, oh, this is it, this is it. Nobody said anything as we drove through the night. Finally, we stopped, I get out, a jeep, you have to get in that jeep there. And I said, well, that's the firing squad. So I had, as I got in, I tried to say to the driver, Buenas noches, senora, would you to go on Good to see you, sir. <laughs> And when I said, I saw Padre Bernardo, another voice said, Bernardo, it was the Colombian priest who had been kidnapped. We were both taken and incarcerated in Guatemala City, next day accused of having entered Guatemala illegally, which tells the story of why I'm so sympathetic to illegal, illegal aliens, have been accused of the same myself. Anyway, it's a long story. Basically, uh, uh, we were both uh, deported from uh, Guatemala City there. So I survived that uh, experience, but you know, it leaves uh, an influence on me, you know, uh, and it has stayed me with a long time. I was similarly deported from Nicaragua when I was reassigned to work in Nicaragua by the dictator Somoza. And when I was exported from there, I went to Honduras to live with the Jesuits in Tegucigalpa. But once again, uh, I was picked up there and deported from there also. Mm -hmm and sent back to the States. But always surviving, that, that's the thing. And of course, that's because I was an American. That's when they were killing Guatemalan priests, El Salvadoran priests, mm -hmm. not only the Jesuits, but the Iasis and so on. So yeah, I can thank my US citizenship. But remember those four American nuns in December of 1980, I did not have the same positive outcome. They were, they were killed. And how old were you when this was happening, these deportations? Yeah, mid-30s. Mid-30s, you were a young man. Uh-huh. And then how did it affect you? You say you still carry it. What is it, did it do to you, an, an emotional, well, it makes, uh, it mental? It makes it less, less trusting, less fear, more fear for When I was deported from Nicaragua, I went to Costa Rica and was uh, allowed to function as a priest there in uh, Puerto Limon along the Caribbean coast. But I would go up to San, San Jose, frequently to pick up the Nicaraguan paper which was brought in daily and sold on the street there in downtown. And uh, uh, many of the uh, uh, deportees from Nicaragua at that time, political deportees, would pick up their copy. But there was a camera there all the time, people there in the background. So all of us were well, fichado is the word in Spanish. We were, uh, they knew we were around and they were recording what we were doing and all that. So. Uh, it makes you nervous knowing that you're being uh, followed and observed, surveilled, and that kind of thing. In Costa Rica, of course, they have a different tradition, but the U.S. influence at that time was very strong also. Once uh, 
uh, when I was traveling to the States. They detained me at the airport there, uh, an American citizen flying from San Jose to the United States. They detained me because there was such pressure from the U.S. Embassy, they were afraid I was coming up to the States to tell stories, of course, which I was doing. And their, the State Department at that time was doing everything it could to uh, keep the American people misinformed. Mm -hmm. However, let me tell you that uh, uh, there's no longer those psychological scars. <laughs> I returned to Central America now. I walk the same streets as I did last May of San Salvador. It's the Maras, the street gangs, that are the dangerous elements. But their violence is directed at their own people, not at tourists. So I, I will even walk the streets at night in San Salvador uh, these days, downtown, you know, the well-lighted streets. What did it do for your faith, your personal faith, to go through some of that stuff? Huh. Well, uh, if anything, it's, it's strengthened uh, it, yeah, all right. Because in Central America in those days, less so today, there are so many people who have such a strong faith uh, <clears throat> uh, in their Christian faith and even in their non-Christian faith uh, who believe that you, you have to uh, work for liberation of yourselves and for other people. You're surrounded by what we use the term a cloud of witnesses. Mm. I say just so many, and they would include the lay people, they include the clergy, I knew any number of the U priests who have been killed there, both in Guatemala and El Salvador. So yeah, it's, uh, it's a great experience to, uh, for, uh, to fortify your faith, to be in a situation of persecution. It doesn't undermine it, it strengthens it. Hmm.